No matter what we do and when we are doing it, standards determine our everyday life. All the things we do, we buy, we eat and drink are in some way or the other tied to standards. The more complex our world is becoming, the more standards have to be established to keep things going. Most of the standards for the European Union are made in Brussels by an organization called CEN, the European Committee for Standardization. Our organization is helping to the standards development in Europe to work. We support the standards development process. CEN is not an authority in the sense of establishing laws. What CEN does is to gather all relevant stakeholders and enforce a discussion with a clear goal. The process is about finding agreement. We use this very special word consensus. It doesn't imply unanimity, so because we would produce very few standards if we had to get absolute agreement from everybody on everything. But consensus reflects the practical agreement of the broad majority of the members on the, on the broad content of the, of the standard. The standard is a living, practical document. And what is developed as a standard today can be developed further in future in, and modified and improved as knowledge and experience grows. By the way, standards as such were not invented by CERN. Of course they have existed since much earlier. And most standards in the past haven't been actively introduced by an authority. They were the outcome of daily life practice. Gold, for example, was weighed with the seeds of the carob plant, which led to a specific standard that is still in use today, known as carrot. 900 years ago, King Henry I had the idea to introduce the yard, which comprised the length from the point of his nose to the end of his pump. At the end of the 18th century, things changed a lot when the first scientist showed up. Measuring things with an elbow, a foot or a royal nose did not really meet their needs for precision anymore. The idea of a logical, reliable and precise system of measurements was born, ideally derived from constant natural phenomena. In 1790, the metric system was developed. One meter was defined as one tenth million of the distance between North and South Pole. Derived from this metric unit, the liter and the kilo were defined. Progress spurred by science created a new field of standards, the technical standards. Technical standardization is, is probably came with the Industrial Revolution from the, the 19th century when manufacturing and of, of goods and putting them, making them available to be sold brought in an element of, of, of repetitivity of processes and procedures to, to make things. For example, standardizing the size and shapes of screws. Without standardized elements, industrial production would not have been possible. Industry loved standards and started to develop more and more of them to raise productivity. Today, we standardize our screws, our doors, our houses, the size of our clothes, our food, our furniture and even condoms. But what about life itself? What about standardizing living organisms? Should man dare to do so? This truly profound ethical question has already been answered a hundred years ago. In the early 1910s, Thomas Hunt Morgan from Columbia University started to create standardized Drosophila flies by inbreeding. He wanted to have comparable organisms for his lab experiments, a successful idea that was then deferred to other life forms. Today, we have populations of standardized bacteria, standardized rats and standardized mice in our labs, organisms that even suffer from standardized diseases. By the way, Standardized life can also be found in the supermarket next door. And it has to be said that nature itself standardized the chemistry of life billions of years ago. DNA, RNA and 20 amino acids build the nuts and bolts of every living creature on Earth. When scientists discovered this fact in 1953, the era of genetic engineering could start. Unfortunately, knowing the screws does not necessarily mean we understand how a machine really works. Genetic engineering is not a real engineering discipline in my opinion. It gives it a sort of sense of you know, professionalism, a sense of 
confidence in the field is that if you had genetic manipulation, it might not sound so com so compelling or so you know predictable as genetic engineering. But actually, there is no engineering, for, as far as I can see, in genetic engineering. Genetic engineering, the way it is actually carried out, can be compared to the attempt to write a novel in an unknown language. It's like inserting single words that we already know into a text that we simply do not understand. Sometimes the word fits and leads to a result, but most of the time, it doesn't. Of course, this approach is more reminiscent of an alchemist than an engineer, and it leads to unpredictable and irreproducible results. A thing that engineers and scientists always try to avoid. If you look through the biological literature, you can see that um, there's a very high level of lack of reproducibility of what is done in, in biology uh, laboratories. So <clears throat> uh, basically people carry out biological research, they write a paper on it, it's published in a journal like Nature, and then a pretty high percentage of those uh, results cannot be reproduced by the laboratories. So we lose much time and effort by simply redoing things because they haven't been done in a standard fashion. Um, many of the things we do are done extremely individually and it would be desirable to do them less individually in a more standardized fashion so that things can be exchanged much more quickly and uh, can get into um, utilization in the lab much more quickly. What is it that should be standardized? So there is a huge design space out there and so many things you could potentially standardize and so many things that the community aspires to standardize. But the order in which you choose to standardize them um, and sort of exactly what components of the system you choose to pin down through standards isn't really clear yet. Uh, standards for defining biological activities and standards for measuring uh, uh, biological activities. Processes, protocols, databases, new methodologies, which are actually taking genetic engineering elements and considering them as functional units. So from our point of view, the reason why we're very interested in standardization is because we believe in systematic design of biological systems. So we take uh, an engineering biology approach to this, which means that we can produce standard biological parts which can then be put together to produce standard biological devices and ultimately standard systems. And we believe that this is really important because um, a key endpoint of what we want to do is industrial translation. The question of standardization in biology is very much driven by a discipline called synthetic biology. It aims at being true genetic engineering by using just those biological elements that are already entirely understood and assembling them to functional organisms like circuits on a circuit board. So it's a bit like, I mean, I use the iPhone as a sort of analogy. If you've got an app running on the iPhone, you've got an operating system that runs your iPhone and then you can download an app. And this little app, which is an, another bit of software, can run in the background of your iPhone software, that's what makes it work. But the app doesn't communicate with the iPhone software or else it wouldn't work. So in synthetic biology you can imagine you've got the cell with its own sort of genetic software program and then we are putting in a little app on top of that. Uh, but the problem is the cell is not a phone, it's not an electronic circuit board, it's a mixture of complex biochemicals and therefore whatever we put in will, by inference, will always interact with the existing cell system. So that is one of the problems that synthetic biology needs to deal with, is how do you make these modules work robustly, reproducibly in the context of the living cell that they're working in. So it seems to be a long road to true bioengineering. It starts with having standardized tools to exchange work between scientists. Furthermore, creating reliable host strains that do not interfere with the genetic apps integrated. Establishing standardized libraries with standardized gene circuits. And of course, finding a standard method of how to link all these components together. In a way, synthetic biology is still a research endeavor. So uh, we, we import ideas from engineering and we, we test them whether they are meaningful in biology. And it might well be that uh, five or ten years from now we realize that one or the other idea that we imported just 
doesn't really make a difference in biology and it's not good. And it might be that a true biological engineering might look a little different from what we have in mind now. Nevertheless, the quest for these standards is there and to a certain extent it is driven by economic interests. The hope that some tiny bacterial strain may become a standard and develop to a giant cash cow. And today the intellectual property issue is not such a big issue because as long as nobody makes really money, the IP holders don't care too much about infringement. They might actually like it because then people get locked in to their patented solution. Uh, but that's a false security because a few years down the road, uh, well, with any luck, there's a lot of money being made. And so you want to think early, like now, what am I using here? Is this something patented or not? Even if today this is of little relevance for your experiments, but it might become relevant later. And if you're then locked into a certain part or sets of parts, um, it's very hard to get away. Having this issue in mind, the idea to have open standards on a basic level to enable innovation is broadly shared within the community, also by those with economic interests. So what I see is that if you let um, uh, intellectual property to move into an open source scheme, then the creativity of the individuals to propose amazing things that can be done is just incredible. In contrast to what happens when and, uh, the owners of the different parts and devices and drugs get paranoid about not releasing their, their, um, their stuff. Standards need to be adopted by people. Uh, and it seems to me that the field is still developing. Uh, you know, so it's the right time to be looking at what the standards might look like. But what the standards might be in, in five years' time could be quite different to what we think now. The time when we know which will be the right standard it's, uh, it's, it's not now. Uh, we, there will be some more generation of standards until we uh, have found the right one. Um, I think at the moment it's still the process of trial and error until we find one that actually really is useful for at least a couple of years.